brushing the teeth, for example. And that's why uh, people that are considered special needs are always at increased risk for oral diseases throughout their lifetime. How about now? Yes. This oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So that was the second slide. <laughs> okay. Now, so I was saying that uh, children with uh, special healthcare needs often face some um, obstacles in, uh, when caring about their oral hygiene. And these are in no particular order, but uh, for example, a child's cooperation and um, physical capabilities or sometimes intellectual capabilities might not allow for a proper brushing or care. And this always, uh, or most of the times, it upsets the child as well, so it might increase uh, increase dental anxiety. Uh, of course, for uh, children with intellectual uh, disabilities, uh, communication is a problem. And even without that, autistic children, for example, um, they don't uh, communicate the same way we do, so often that's becoming an obstacle uh, when we want to take care of their oral hygiene. Uh, some research shows that uh, caregivers or uh, parents' negative past dental experience also makes them a little bit reluctant to take their child to the dentist. Um, and of course, um, dentists have to be uh, educated and trained and they have to have special experience to deal with special healthcare needs and they have to be willing to do that because it requires more patience and a little bit different tactics to uh, treat a child with special healthcare needs. And of course, priorities, uh, because most of the times parents will obviously deal with the medical issues which might be more urgent at that time and might neglect uh, or put the oral health into second um, chance. But uh, keep in mind that uh, the mouth and the oral cavity is also an important part of the body and if there is any infection or any disease in the mouth, it can spread to the body. So it's absolutely important, of course, to take care of the medical issues but not to neglect the oral health as well. And unfortunately, I wish we were living in another uh, world, but finances is also a big problem. And in UIE, insurances most of the times would not cover even medical uh, treatment if the condition is genetic. But when it comes to dental, it's really hard to get any coverage from insurances. And unfortunately, that's a really big problem we're facing at the moment when we want to provide dental treatment uh, for kids uh, that have special needs. And because of these barriers, uh, and sometimes associated with the condition that the patient has, some other um, oral conditions are associated. Uh, for example, some conditions are associated with uh, teeth malformations, like the tooth is not formed properly, or is not developed properly, or the size of the tooth is not correct, or even the number of the teeth. Sometimes some children, some conditions are related with extra teeth, some are related with missing teeth, and also uh, jaw problems. So that might lead to malocclusion or crowding, and all of these will eventually result in a heavy buildup on the teeth of plaque, bacteria around the teeth, so the teeth are becoming more prone to cavities. And research shows that children with special healthcare needs have higher caries indices compared to children that don't have uh, any other medical condition. And of course, uh, children, because of the previous reasons, they also have increased risk of developing gum disease. Uh, like gingivitis, which is the infection of the gum, or even more severe uh, types of periodontal diseases. Uh, children with physical disabilities uh, that are not able to stand or even walk properly, or even children that have epilepsy and are prone to seizures, they are more frequently having fractures of the teeth. Uh, also, a lot of children with special needs have some damaging oral habits, for example, uh, bruxism, clenching, tongue thrusting, or, or even more simple things like even pouching food in the mouth, which if the food sits on the teeth throughout the day, all day, if it's not cleaned out properly, obviously the teeth are exposed to bacteria and then cavities. And 
on top of all these other unfortunate problems, we also uh, have, these children usually have oral aversion. They're very sensitive to um, stimuli, especially in the mouth. And they're very concerned when it comes to the um, mouth. And that's why they create some aversion towards any um, oral treatment or even brushing. Now, I just wanted to go through because or, or for me, all of these are important, but most important is to learn how to prevent cavities because cavities is actually uh, proven by Center for Disease Control and National Institute of Health that it's the number one most common uh, disease in children, regardless of uh, the medical condition or not, is the number one disease. So we need to learn how to prevent it. So how do cavities form? So when we eat food, and in particular carbohydrates, I will split carbohydrates into starches and sugars, and let's talk about sugars. So specifically when we eat sugars, we have bacteria in the mouth that feed on those sugars. And then eventually the bacteria will start producing acid. This acid sits on the tooth surface and the tooth starts losing minerals. Our saliva usually is our defense mechanism in this case, so the saliva will make sure that the minerals will go back to the tooth and it will recover. But if it's repeated over a long period of time, the saliva will not be able to match the loss of minerals, so more and more minerals are lost and then eventually we have a hole or a cavity or caries. Now there are different stages of course of uh, tooth decay or cavities. On the first two pictures, we can see uh, that the cavity is only affecting the top layer of the tooth, which is called enamel. This is the white uh, part of the tooth in these photos. And in these stages, it's not painful and it's much, much easier to treat. Uh, sometimes we don't even have to do any procedure. If it's really initial cavity, we just use some remineralizing agents to help put the minerals lost back in the tooth so it doesn't become a full proper cavity. Or most of the times, maybe a small uh, filling, sometimes without even having to use uh, local anesthetic. Now, when it gets deeper and deeper, for example, on uh, picture number three, now the cavity is deeper, it's into denting. Denting is the second layer of the tooth, which is yellow in this picture. And this is where the pain starts. So. Definitely, even for baby teeth, in order to treat such a cavity, we have to numb the tooth with local anesthetic, first of all. And this could be treated with either a filling or if the cavity is affecting multiple layers of the tooth, multiple surfaces of the tooth, we can cover it with a crown. And on the fourth picture, this is where we don't want to reach because the cavity already is touching the pulp. Uh, pulp is where we have all the nerve and blood vessels of the tooth and it becomes extremely painful and then slowly slowly the bacteria spread through the nerve and the nerve dies out and then they exit through the bone and the gum and that's when, when we see a swelling or an abscess in the gum next to the tooth. Uh, once the nerve is dead there is no pain. So a lot of parents come to the clinic and they are surprised that there is a tooth that is dead because the child is dead and causing the pain. pain. And that's because that's because that's already that's died. Already died. Right. So the sensitivity so causes. Cause now, when we now reach when stage we four, four, four uh, obviously the treatment is a lot more difficult. More difficult. So, so it requires a surgical or a deep nerve treatment depending on how far down the down is affected. Uh, uh, and, uh, and there's ground to cover the cover the tooth. But even or sometimes you might have to remove the tooth. Now, a common question. Of course, we have to treat baby teeth. Uh, because keep in mind that there's nothing that will change change under the age of years. The back baby pain in the mouth is 11, 12, 12 years old is all the child child's development. So if so you don't if you don't treat the baby how it gets it gets it starts getting it might get my effect it might get my effect always under the baby we have the new the, the new the new sitting at the very close proximity and the new tooth is not is not get it get developed developed the bacteria spreads from the baby to the new tooth the development of the new tooth might be affected 
Now, now the good news, the good news is that, is that all of this can be prevented. Let me see, I can see, I change. Change. So, so we, we go, th go through a few tips and tricks on how to prevent public Sorry, sorry. Uh, your, 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 your. Okay, so now let's see how do we prevent, how do we take care of our child's oral health or how do we prevent the cavities? The obvious, so brush the teeth at least two times a day, at least two times a day for two minutes every time. And yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Perfect. Great. Thank you. So, uh, first, the obvious. Uh, we have to brush the teeth at least two times a day for two minutes each time. Use a timer, use an alarm because two minutes is a very long time for brushing. And you should start brushing your child's uh, tooth from when the first tooth comes in the mouth. Usually, that's about the age of six months to one year. And we have to use fluoridated toothpaste. There is no doubt that fluoride helps to prevent cavities. Um, now, there is a lot of toothpaste in the market. So the evidence shows that for toothpaste to be effective uh, and have an anti caries effect, it has to be at least 1,000 parts per million fluoride. Most of the products in the market from 0 to 2, 3, and then 3 to 5 or 6, they have 550 parts per million, which is a bit low. So that's why it is recommended to visit your dentist earlier, we will see that later, so that they will examine and see if your child needs a higher fluoride toothpaste. If your child can brush alone or wants to try brushing, let them do it, but make sure you check how they do it, you help them do it properly and finish the brushing for them, especially the night brushing is important that the parent is doing it. Uh, if some patients have um, aversion to specific tastes or textures and a lot of uh, fluoride toothpaste don't uh, taste very good to them. So you can use SLS free toothpaste. SLS is a surfactant that they use to mix the ingredients in the toothpaste. And usually if that's not there, if it's uh, SLS free, it becomes less foamy and the texture is a little better. If the child cannot have toothpaste at all because of the texture or even the taste or the smell, you can take fluoride mouthwash, you can dip your uh, toothbrush in it and use it to brush the teeth. And uh, there are uh, different products. For example, uh, the product that I'm showing here, is, it's a mousse, it's called tooth mousse, uh, which has calcium and phosphate. And the plus version is, has additional fluoride, which you can brush it on the teeth after the regular brushing, but this you have to leave on the teeth. Uh, usually this product has a bit better taste. Uh, it has different flavoring like strawberry, vanilla, mint, tutti frutti, so it sometimes is a little better flavor than the regular toothpaste. And cleaning the tongue is also very important because uh, bacteria can sit on the tongue and from the tongue can spread to the teeth. So using a tongue cleaner is very important if your child allows you, because sometimes the reflex, you know, and the gagging reflex is high, so they might not be able to accept it. Now, when it comes to the toothpaste, this is the uh, American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry recommendation on how much toothpaste to use. So for zero to three years, you have to compare it to a rice grain and from three to six years, it becomes pea-sized toothpaste. So even if you have a toothpaste that is a little higher on fluoride concentration, for example, six plus can start taking adult strength toothpaste, uh, fluoride toothpaste, which is 1,450 parts per million fluoride, they still have to use very small amount of that. Okay, just a second, it's getting stuck. Okay, now selecting the right toothbrush. Uh, first of all, uh, small to medium head size of toothbrush is recommended, so that is enough to fit in the child's mouth and medium bristle strength, because if it's too soft, it doesn't brush properly. If it's too hard, it might hurt the gums or even remove part of the tooth if it's brushed too harshly. 
for uh, people with dexterity problems, there is different designs. There are special hand grip toothpaste or sorry, toothbrushes, but you can also, I put some, it's a very creative uh, photo or different ways of making it better for them to hold the tooth, toothpaste, the toothbrush, sorry, because it's usually very thin. Uh, and on the top uh, left photo, you can see a special toothbrush that has three heads. So you just cover all the sides of a tooth with one toothbrush. So you don't have to turn and twist the toothbrush to reach different sides. And on the upper right shoulder, uh, photo I'm showing, um, actually it's not very clear, but it's a finger toothbrush. These are finger silicone toothbrushes, which are usually used for brushing small baby's teeth, but you can also use it for bigger kids if they're not able to take the regular um, toothbrush. And electric toothbrushes are recommended. Uh, it's proven that they show better efficiency of cleaning the dirt on the teeth than manual toothbrushes. And they have timer, which also helps to remind the kids that they have to keep brushing. I said the timer is set at two minutes usually, and they have pressure sensors. So if you put too much pressure, it will give you a red light or it might even stop turning. Now, there's different brushing positions because brushing somebody else's teeth might be a bit challenging. So usually parents tell me that they stand in front of the child's mouth and they're trying to see and find a way to brush the teeth. But it's it's better to stand behind the child. So you have and stand in the mirror, for example. So you have access, better access on the back teeth. For smaller children, if you see on the second photo, this is what is called the knee to knee position. And sometimes we use it in the clinic to check the teeth of very small uh, babies, where, for example, one parent can hold the hands and the legs and the other parent can have the head on the lap and brush the teeth. Again, it gives you better control. It's like sitting on the dental chair. So, the same way on the floor, you can ask them to lie down on the bed on your lap and you can brush the teeth. Uh, Many times I tell the parents, if your child is on a wheelchair, try to brush the teeth while they're on the wheelchair. Just make it lean it back so you can have access and see the back teeth as well. Now, brushing is not fun for kids. Uh, they don't really like it, especially the small ones, but you have to make it fun. So they like to do it and they're excited about brushing time, brushing hour. So start with uh, tell show do is a good way. So basically, you tell them, do it just like me. You brush your teeth and you show them how can they do that. Uh, give them positive reinforcement. Give them gifts. Give them a sticker. Uh, if they brush their teeth, uh, singing and brushing song also helps. And uh, keep in mind that we have to make it a habit. The more they're used to it, they know it's coming, the more they can do it. Now, a few tips about diet and oral health. So the relationship between diet and oral health is bi-directional because that means that the, the food that you eat affects your teeth. And if your teeth are not healthy or they're painful, it affects what you will be able to eat later. So as we explained late earlier, carbohydrates are, especially sugars, are eaten by bacteria. They produce the acid. And which will eventually lead to cavities. Now, there are different forms of sugars. There are natural sugars, which are found in fruits, for example, and there are free sugars, which is the additional sugar that we're adding in cakes and sweets. So the type of sugar that the child has is very important. Of course, we want the child to have more fruits rather than candies and chocolates and sweets. The amount is important because, as we said, the saliva has... Um, a certain capacity of buffering the demineralization, but if we eat too many sweets during the day, the saliva will not be able to help us. And the frequency. So usually um, how often you have sweets is also important to, uh, in terms of preventing cavities. Now, when visiting the dentist, which is also a very sensitive topic for young kids or kids with special needs, all kids, regardless of any medical condition, should have established a dental home or have been to the dentist from the time the first tooth erupts, that is around the age of six months, or maximum by one year of life. 
So this is usually done to slowly familiarize the child with the environment, have a discussion with your dentist to give you instructions on how to prevent cavities. Scheduling the appointments is important when it comes to uh, people with uh, special care needs. Most of the times we prefer to book the appointment early morning or if there is any time you know your child that is in a better mood, maybe use that time that, that as an advantage to take them to the dentist. Make sure whenever you visit, uh, you have to update your dentist with your child's medical condition if there has been any changes and give them a tip on what they like, what they don't like, bring a, a toy or a comfort item to the dentist in order to help with the behavior of the child, behavior management. So the doctor will assess the child, we do a comprehensive dental examination, we uh, check if they have any caries or not, we assess if there is any injuries um, or if there is any harmful habits. And then based, based on the findings, we will plan a treatment that is customized to your child's uh, needs. Uh, usually for special care patients, we always have to have, or most of the times we have to have a consent uh, from the medical physician uh, before we perform any procedure. Uh, what I find interesting is that um, in, in UIE, if I'm not wrong, we don't have a medical record book for the children. So I think it will be, it, it is interesting for you to keep a record of your child's uh, visits, not only medical, but dental as well. So you know, when was the last time you visited the dentist, what has been done and what is recommended maybe for the future. It's important to have frequent recalls in order to uh, catch any cavity at an early stage and always, always prevention is better than cure, better and easier than cure. And keep in mind that it will take time for the child to acclimatize, to get comfortable at the dentist. So it, it maybe it's not going to be from the first visit. Maybe you will need repeated visits uh, until the child is comfortable uh, to be able to even have a dental exam or even receive treatment on the chair. Um, often uh, for special care need patients, we might recommend, a dentist might recommend treatment under sedation or general anesthesia because of the difficulties. Or even sometimes if there is a big amount of dental work needed, it is recommended. Now, just summarizing, prevention is always better than cure. Uh, sealants is something we used for the first permanent molar teeth usually. That's to protect them from getting cavities because it's proven that the first adult molar tooth is one of the most commonly affected adult teeth in terms of cavities. Uh, we can clean the teeth and plate fluoride varnish. Fluoride varnish is a very high concentration fluoride way of that we use in the office to protect from cavities. And the visit to the dentist should be often, usually we say every three months. I would like to close with a statement from the Special Care Dentistry Association that is our duty as care providers and as well as the general public, not only for doctors, but for everyone to get educated uh, in the importance of uh, proper oral care uh, and that all individuals with special care needs deserve and have the right to have the same level of care like the general public. So thank you very much. And uh, we can hear some questions if there's any. Thank you, Dr. Mariana. It was uh, Most very welcome. insightful and very informative. In fact, for me as a speech and feeding therapist, because usually parents come and ask, Six, seven months, can we start brushing their teeth and what toothpaste can we mm. use, what size and all that. So today's presentation was very informative, uh, informative as well. Um, you see, in that case, I think you, you have to refer, you know, because they, they have to visit early. Again, not for uh, treating cavities, to make sure the cavities don't come, you know, because by the time they reach the clinic, it's already a little late. So we want to make sure we don't reach to the last stage.
Sure. Uh, I mean, from today's slide, I also understood that the last stage where it, it goes up to the root and we mm -hmm. should prevent all that. Definitely when a patient comes and um, they have cavities, we will definitely refer for a dentist. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, Any other questions? Okay. Anybody, any other questions? <laughs> if not, maybe we can proceed with yeah. uh, Banu's uh, presentation. Okay, I think there is no other question. Sure. Um, no I will just share my screen. Yes, sure. Okay, is my screen visible now? Mm, yes, it is, but not in full uh, size. Not in full size. Is it better? Mm, huh? No. No. Uh, I think uh, when you share the screen, I think share entire screen because that's what I did wrong before. Uh, again, doctor. When you share the screen, there is different options. I think you have to share entire screen. Okay, let me just yeah. try again. Yeah, is it? Okay. Great. Okay, so... Okay. So today, uh, th thank you everyone for joining us today. Now I'll be presenting about the importance of oral hygiene, but from a feeding and swallowing uh, perspective. And I'll, I will also explain uh, the relationship between feeding and swallowing, because some parents are confused if the child is having feeding issues or having swallowing issues. So firstly, um, I would like to emphasize on aspiration, um, especially for kids with special needs. They are very uh, prone to aspiration. What is aspiration? So uh, our throat, okay, there is two tubes. The front one is the, it's a way to the lungs and the behind tube is the way to the stomach. So there is two tubes and when we swallow the first tube, which is the trachea going to the lungs, it will be closed. And the food, if you can see, there is a green, green, um, there is a green, this thing in the picture. So that is the food. So when we swallow, the food will actually go to the back, to the food track and goes into the stomach. If um, uh, the child is having uh, swallowing difficulties or any muscle weakness, then some of the food might escape into the trachea to the lungs. And that is what we call as aspiration. And if there is bacteria in their mouth, in their oral cavity, like there is uh, candida on their tongue or there is bacteria in their teeth and the saliva, enters into the lungs, then it becomes aspiration pneumonia. So aspiration is pneumonia is something that we should prevent because it's a very high risk for death as well. So it's important to clean all aspects of oral cavity. When we say cleaning the mouth, it includes the teeth, the palate, the tongue, and the inner cheeks because bacteria can sit anywhere. So especially with individuals with swallowing problem, um, kids with special needs who is even on pack, on stomach tube or on nose tube, it's still important for us to clean their mouth twice a day because if we don't clean, then bacteria just sits inside the mouth and if they aspirate the saliva, it can cause aspiration pneumonia. So for kids with bad oral hygiene, the cavities will be formed. And then as we saw the slideshow from Dr. Mary and just now, uh, it will cause painful, it will cause pain, it will cause discomfort. And finally, they tend to reject the food 
and for them they will relate eating as a painful thing and uh, they would uh, do not want to sit for a meal time and completely avoid food. So this is one factor that we want to eliminate uh, from the feeding and swallowing aspect. So it's important for them to have a good oral hygiene. So firstly, uh, what is feeding? Feeding is an act or process of eating or being fed. It means before the food goes into the mouth. So feeding is uh, it's just a process or an act. So uh, when the child comes to us, we will analyze uh, which factor is actually contributing them to have feeding difficulties. So these are the few factors, uh, environment, support and stability, creative utensils, um, increase in the consistency. Can I see the slide? My slides are not visible. Um, yes, they are Ms. Uh, because one of the participants mentioned that this is, I think, is not full screen. Uh, I don't know how can we expand it. Okay, let me just try to share the screen again. Yeah. Is it the same? This is what uh, I can do from this device. Is it okay? Is it visible now? Okay. Sorry, it's visible, it's just it's within the team viewer, it's not uh, expanded. Mm. Okay, so I'll just continue. So these are the few factors that we will um, analyze and assess from our feeding session usually. So for the environment part, we will look into the family dynamics like is eating fun? Is everyone sitting together at the table with the child to eat? And is the environment calm or is it noisy? Um, and make sure there is no distractions like TV or any gadgets. Um, child need to be aware of what is what they are putting inside their mouth. They need to feel the textures. They need to chew properly. So there, there should not be any distraction while they are eating. And it, there's also should be a routine like they have morning breakfast, snacks, and then lunch, snacks again, and then dinner. So when it's a routine, it's it's better for the child. So the child will have a cue like okay. Uh, this is the time that I should eat, so I will eat. So routine is also important in the uh, environment factor. So next is support and stability. Uh, make sure the child has an appropriate feeding chair. So the child's head, neck, back and legs should be supported, especially for special needs. We should always look into their head and neck support uh, 90 degrees. And also the, their legs should not be hanging in the air so that they feel secure that they are sitting well and secure, stable, and they will have their proper meal time. Uh, also, usually children with special needs, we need to secure them with belt. They have a table in front of them. We can use mirror-based feeding so that the child can just play with their food, uh, see what is entering their mouth. Try to lick the food if it's uh, spinning out of your mouth. And also a 90 degree posture is important. Um, so if a child has behavior issues, like for them, meal time is not fun, it's not interesting, then we try to use creative utensils with them. So if you have a spoon squeezer, like the blue one, it's called spoon squeezer. If the child doesn't want the hands to get dirty, doesn't want the hand to be sticky, then you can just put the food inside the spoon squeezer and give them. So whenever they press the squeeze, uh, the food will come out. So it's something funny for them. 
So you can even decorate the spoon squeezes with your favorite cartoons or superheroes or anything. You can just decorate with lots of stickers so that meal time is fun. You can also use fruit squeezers, uh, like there's two fruit squeezers here. We can put fruits inside and give the child and they can chew. So for kids who wants to transit from puree to chewing, you can uh, start giving this, like you can start putting the soft fruits first, like banana, kiwis, and then slowly move to hot fruits like apple, cucumbers, carrots, so this will enhance their chewing and biting skills. And then uh, you can use creative color plate and spoon, creative straws, and also honey bear bottles for straw drinking. Um, after that, we will also uh, assess the child. if The child is accepting the food in all the senses, meaning visually when the child sees food, they are comfortable and they, are, can, they can touch the food, they can smell the food and they don't gag when it's placed on their tongue and they don't show any discomfort pain with the food. So this is where the hypersensitivity or hyposensitivity of oral cavity comes in. If they are very sensitive towards uh, these senses that visually they, they are not accepting, um, like pureed food, if you touch, it will get dirt uh, on, your, on your hands. So they are not accepting it visually. And then the smell of the food if egg has certain smell and they just gag when they smell the food, so they are not accepting. So we have to look at carefully uh, at these factors. And then we have to work on desensitization if they are having hyper or hyposensitivity of the oral cavity. So nextly is progressively increase in consistency. So if your child, uh, a child should start eating pureed food like the smoothed applesauce by six, uh, at six months old, and then progress to chunky food and then grated, and then finally chopped or sliced food. So even if, if your child is coming to us and they are still in puree stage and you want the child to start biting and chewing, chewing food, we can't go immediately from puree to sliced or chopped food. It has to go progressively. We need to go one by one, step by step at a time. So once they pass the puree food, then we go to chunky and then grated, and then we will give them the uh, for chewing, for chewing and biting. So uh, other thing is behavioral strategies. So if uh, the child comes to us and we assess all the aspects, the child is not having any sensitivity issues, there is no swallowing issues, everything is fine. And it could be behavior, that is why they are rejecting food and they have certain preference to certain food only. So in that case, we will usually try to give positive reinforcement for each bite, try to give reward. Like after 10 bites, you get to go to the playground or after 10 bites, you get to watch uh, Coco Melon, things like that. And then we can do social storytelling, like uh, show them a story saying how important is good food and what good food will do to you, that kind of social storytelling. And then res respond to hunger cues. If uh, they are too stubborn and they want certain kind of food only, then we try to delay uh, until we only give them one choice of food and try to delay uh, till they accept that one food that we give them. And then uh, usually when we are feeding them with a the new food, we do not uh, just put that put them inside their mouth. We have to describe what food is it, what size is it, how is it, and then slowly tell them, okay, the food is going to enter your mouth, look at the food, okay, let's open your mouth. So these are all behavioral uh, strategies that we can use with them so that they will uh, eat better. Okay, so the next one, uh, we are done with the feeding and all the factors. So the next one is swallowing. So what is swallowing? Swallowing is a process of uh, 
movements of substance from the mouth to the stomach. So it's a mechanism. So there is pre-oral stage, oral stage, pharyngeal stage, and the esophageal stage. So for the pre-oral stage is what we are talking about, the feeding, the interest in accepting the food, visually accepting the food. That is all the pre-oral stage. And coming to the oral stage is the, we have to make sure that uh, their lips, their tongue, their palate, and their teeth are intact. So if any of the, there is any weakness in lips, tongue, palate, or the teeth, then we will need to do uh, exercises for that. So for example, lip strengthening and movement exercise, because a good lip seal is important for a good swallow reflex to happen. When you close your mouth, your lips are closed as well. So you will create a high pressure inside the oral cavity and that's when the swallowing reflex will trigger. Otherwise, if you just open your mouth and you don't close your mouth, there is no lip seal, then the food will come out and it's hard for you to push the food to the back of the mouth. So then if there is a tongue weakness and then you know tongue movement and strengthening exercises, palatal movement exercises, and if a child is too sensitive to open their mouth, doesn't want to open their mouth, then we try to do open, closed jaw movement exercises, chewing and biting exercises, and also jaw stability exercises. So all these exercises um, covers the oral stage of the swallowing so that the food is nicely uh, chewed and formed into bolus before they swallow it. The next stage is the pharyngeal stage. Okay, so this is where uh, the most important part that no aspiration should occur. So we should always check if the child is breathing through their nose and not through their mouth, because if they are using their mouth to breathe and then we put food into their mouth and then they panic and they do not want to swallow, do not want to eat because they are already using their mouth to breathe. So it's important for them to uh, breathe through their nose rather than their mouth. And then we have to rule out for any adenoids or tonsil issues, rule out on noisy breathing or snoring at night because all these can contribute to uh, not wanting to swallow. And then strengthening vocal cord. If the child is having very weak cough, especially for a child who has um, asthma or they are after cardiac surgery, so they don't have uh, good breath support, then their cough expectoration will also be inefficient. So we will do the vocal cord strengthening so that they can cough effectively because only a good cough can expectorate the food that is aspirated. And then we will also do the strengthening swallowing muscles, like giving stimulation over the neck area and some neck movement exercises. So the esophageal stage is something that is not in our hands and it's mostly on medical examination and it's only visible in BFSS or it can be treated with medication or surgery. So that is all for now for feeding and swallowing. Is there any other questions? Uh, thank you, Ms. Panu. I just wanted to take advantage of what you mentioned at the beginning, that uh, bacteria can spread uh, from the mouth uh, to the lungs or the rest of the body. So it's not only important to... There you go. Yeah. yeah. So it's not only important to prevent the cavities, but... Don't left any cavities like an infection from the feet, but the bacteria from the cavities that are left untreated can spread to the rest of the body as well, so based on your presentation. Yes, because most parents take it very lightly, like what's bacteria in the mouth, what's cavity for, so it's very important because it can cause aspiration pneumonia. Yeah, thank you.
Um, is there any other questions to Dr. or to me? Uh, there's one question from our guest, Doctor. Do we need to brush the teeth after breakfast as well as before breakfast? Okay, that's a common question, actually. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, usually, most people do it before. Um, ideally, it should be done after. Uh, Yes, but you don't have to have you don't have to ha brush before and after as long as you did the brushing uh, in the morning. Yeah. Uh, if there is no any other question, then we can finish. We are done for today. Is there any other last question? No. <laughs> okay. All right then. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us and uh, being with us throughout the presentation. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All. All right. Thank you, Doctor. Great. Have a good day. Have a good day. Bye bye. Bye bye. I think somebody's typing something. Let's see <laughs> before we close. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.